Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble, and I am excited to be here with Emil Pandolfi. We are going to talk about his journey, his years of playing piano for millions of people and tons of streams on Spotify. We definitely want to talk about that. Um, it's I love that I have him on the show because we have a lot of singer songwriters on this show, not as many that are, you know, instrumentalists. So I'm really excited to talk about your career, Emil, and inspire those who are listening who are instrumentalists. So let's get started and um, just let everybody know a little bit about your journey with music, how you got started, kind of uh, just the the whole trajectory from beginning to where you are now. Okay. Um, first of all, I need to say that given my advanced age, um, I've been doing this for about 50 years. So what I'm having to say is the old way of doing things. I, I have I know that on your podcast you interview a whole lot of people. There is so much information on the uh, on the web now and so many new technologies that I'm not involved with. But I made a very successful career, the I'll just say the old fashioned way with uh starting out playing okay so i've been playing piano since i was a child and i got my degree in music uh, like so many of us did uh but then when it uh, became time to make a living at it i i never considered doing anything else it, it's, it's not there were, there were times that i did have other jobs like uh, i worked construction for a little bit i was a janitor to make ends meet and i i, I was happy with that i was fine with that but I started playing cocktail piano uh, years ago, and uh, there's very little of that going on nowadays. You still every now and then you find a place where a person's playing in a restaurant or a cocktail bar. And, and, and what I learned from that time was how to entertain people because you're playing piano, you're having conversations, you're telling jokes, you're having a good old time. And I learned a lot doing that cocktail piano. I moved over, I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there's a whole lot in the book that I wrote, but we moved over into, I wanted to do concerts. So we rented a space and did con and did our first concert in a rental space. It was a beautiful hall, but we rented it and we did, did all the prep work, like, uh, uh, tick getting, getting tickets printed and marketing and all of that word of mouth happened. And I started getting more requests for concerts and they were, uh, it's all me and a piano. And I have some uh, comedic monologues because I have I have an ability to do to write comedy and have some history with that. So so we then started doing uh, c concerts in uh, performing arts centers, usually about four or five hundred seats, more like a recital hall type venue. And uh, we got up to as much as twelve hundred seats when we were doing well. We had uh, maybe over over in the in the next five years we got to maybe like 30 concerts in a year and we did that all ourselves we did not have an agent it was my by this but when i say we that's my wife and i because my wife is a very good business person and she became my manager and she arranged she arranged renting halls she arranged photo shoots for me all the things that are that a record company would have to do and we were, uh, and so we were kind of a teensy, one tiny record company. I'll, anyway, I'll slow it down. We, we, we went, we did more and more of that. I recorded 30 albums in the last 25 years. And, uh, and when it came time to put those albums up on streaming, we did that so that now we have a great many stream. We have something like 400 songs up on streaming. And I still make, um, uh, I still make one, video uh, a week of fine art 
if I find a fine artist and, and put one of my songs to to a, a video so you can watch some very beautiful artwork while you listen to one song. So we, we're still doing things, but I'm in no way up to the technology that you and some of your guests are. I, I learned a lot <clears throat> listening to one of your podcasts just now. As I say, this I did it the old-fashioned way, but if that if that's any use to anybody, I can talk talk about that for at length. Absolutely, and, and the first thing I want to say is that you were smart enough to take all those albums and put them on streaming, and I'm guessing you're doing decently. I mean, I have heard that instrumentalists can do very well with streaming, even though you know we all know we get paid less than pennies, right, for streams, but. Are you currently having some good royalties coming in from streaming? Yes. Well, I have. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm making my living from streaming. So that's that. So yes, you are. Yeah. So, uh, but I have 800 million streams of my music over over the time. So like uh, 700 million on Pandora and another 110 million on Spotify and other so once you get into the millions of streams yes you can make a living but uh so so yes we tried we, we started again 40 years ago 45 years 1990 whatever that is and um that's when i started concerts but i've been playing longer than that when we started doing that as, as the technology changed we changed with it and we did take my my wife i say did all the work of it, but she took all of my CDs, that, which at that time were about 20 CDs. I mean, uh, when we when we started into streaming, and she did all the paperwork that you have to do to submit each song with all its metadata and submit it to CD Baby, and then CD Baby uh, distributes it to all the digital distributors. Yeah. So she did that. And, and we said as much as we could, we're, we're kind of kept getting behind now because the, it seems like the technology is moving so fast, so so crazy fast that it's hard for us to keep up. Uh, but we but we're, we're, we're looking at it. We're working on it. Not, nothing like Web3 or or <laughs> NFTs or I mean, it just drives me crazy. I don't even want to know that. <laughs> Well, you know what though you don't have to because you have you have you've amassed a body of work and then you've put that catalog up on streaming and you're able to bring in income now from the work that you did in the past so i think that's a really important point that you know you're always amassing these assets that can work for you in the future so i'm curious and i know you know your wife is doing a lot of this for you which is so amazing right to have that person yeah. that has those skills i think <laughs> If you know, if musicians don't have those skills within themselves, you got to have that person on your team that has that organizational ability and the ability to like deal with details and you know all the business paperwork stuff that a lot of us hate. Um, but as far as just putting them up there, did you also seek out playlists? Have you gotten on any you know uh, editorial playlists or things like that that have helped your streams? We still have not managed to get on curated playlist I, and I we've been trying believe me uh, we, we have we're on thousands and thousands of personal playlists but we haven't got on curated playlists yet and if we did the income stream would would just explode I mean I know that's a fact because you if, uh, if you get on a in this, for example some of <clears throat> pardon me a lot of my music is called peaceful piano uh, playlist wise gen generically and we're on maybe 57,000 playlists of individuals. But but if I were to get on Peaceful Piano on a curated playlist on Spotify, for example, uh, they would have all already have 6 million listeners. So you would automatically have the at least the potential to be played for a whole lot more people. That's so right. So we, we are trying to do that by, I have a tech guy who looks at statistics all the time and who's my audience which what kind of tunes get on peaceful piano and we're <clears throat> trying to look at all those algorithms and make sense of it so is there something that i could play that's still me but that hopefully gets the ear of the curator makes sense so are you still then creating new music and and are you releasing it on cd anymore or are you mostly going directly to digital 
I'm not releasing any more CDs because, as you know, they're dinosaurs. And we, and years ago, just I'll just, just anecdotally again, the old-fashioned way when we were selling CDs. In our best year, we sold something like close to 400,000 CDs in one wow. year. I have one one of my my very first album, which was made in 1990, has sold 600,000 units by itself as a CD, as a hard copy. Now, now we we might sell 3,000 CDs in a year. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing of the past. But what I do is I I uh, I will take a a, a new song and arrange it. My whole, my whole, my whole strength is arranging well-known songs for solo piano in a way that seems meaningful and people like. I, obviously, people like it. So, uh, I have one song that was streamed seventy million times. Mm -hmm. So that means that, and it's mostly by uh, from uh, eighteen to thirty-five year old women, as far as the stats go. Yeah, it makes sense makes sense and wow so that's i mean the thing is that if you're not really playing out it's harder to sell cds i do think that cds can still be sold at shows mm -hmm. and some people do still buy them online um but are you currently playing out or are you mostly just doing digital right now well mostly uh, digital right now i haven't i haven't officially retired by the way i'm 76 years old so I'm, wow I'm not... okay let's just <laughs> applaud you for that that's awesome that you're still making music yeah <laughs> but uh when the pandemic hit we canceled about 10 shows like everybody did so in that time my wife who is doing it's not she's doing 99.100 percent of the work on the you know, she writes the contracts. As, again, we've had, there was a, a couple of years when we had um, agents, but we didn't do any better with an agent than we did by ourselves. So we went back to being just the two of us. But that means that she was making marketing. She happens to be a very good artist and she was making all my art, art marketing materials. She was arranging photo shoots. Um, she, she did, she wrote contracts. She designed lighting. And we had some really beautiful lighting in many of these shows. But she was kind of burnt out about 10 years ago, and we were still doing it. So when the pandemic hit and we were not doing any shows, we said, hmm, this feels pretty good. And I took that time to write a book and to uh, put more songs up on streaming. And we found out, we, I mean, we said well, we're living most, streaming is paying the bills. So we two together decided that, and I'm not going to do any more performing arts centers, uh, at least as my as my retirement thing now. But I'm going to do private events, and we've done a few private events since then. So mm. the corporation was. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, private events can be really great. Yeah. Um. So, wow. Um. As far as like during. Well, let's actually let's go back to the when you were doing the performing arts centers because I don't want to miss this. Mm -hmm. I think that you know a lot of performers really would love to get into that space of working with performing arts centers and doing small theaters like that. And I have some students that are doing that. You know, they have like one woman shows, or you know, a lot of times it's a program, right? Like what you were saying, where it's you're not just playing piano; you're also telling stories or doing comedy in between, which I think really makes you unique. And probably it makes it easier for you to get booked than just someone who's playing piano. So how do you how did you present that to the performing arts centers? How did you kind of talk about your program and how do you why do you think you guys were just as successful at doing this as when you had agents? Uh, uh, because most of of all these years, most of it is word of mouth. That also says I live in South Carolina, and uh, most of my of, of all these concerts, hundreds of concerts, have been in uh, five or six states in the Southeast. So here, here's a, a couple of points that I want to make maybe now or later. One is that um, you find your niche and you pour, and, and I found my niche, which is, we'll call it peaceful piano, easy piano, easy listening, um, cover tunes of, you know, people who love piano music, but their cover tunes, no, no originals. 
So I found that niche and I pour everything, all my energy into that one thing. And I don't try to play like Billy Joel and I don't try to play like Elton John. And frankly, I can't. And they, they did themselves great. I play like me. And, um, and, and the reason, again, how we got into it is, is mostly word of mouth. And, and you think about it, the, the, the first point was find your niche and do that and don't try to do something else. And the second thing was, all of these uh, performing arts centers, they have one big shot. If they're big enough to have Yo-Yo Ma, they have Yo-Yo Ma, but they have to fill up their season with another 12 artists that maybe you never heard of, but they're brilliant. And, and um, our, <clears throat> our performing arts center here in Greenville, South Carolina, does the same thing. They'll have one huge star or as best much as they can afford. And then they fill up their concert series with other really good artists, uh, string quartets, uh, uh, people like me that you may never have heard of. But when you go there, you say, wow, I really enjoy that. And then you tell somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so so and plus there are numerous performing arts centers throughout America that can't afford Yo-Yo Ma. Mm -hmm. And they get what do they do? They get me. They get somebody else. I mean, seriously, you know. They, uh, uh, so, so if you find your niche in my case was, was uh, 500, 500 to a thousand seat halls, uh, in that mostly were, by the way, it wasn't just word of mouth. We went to the musicians conferences, uh, for many, for several years, we went to five, uh, national musicians conferences and we would have a booth and we had, uh, at, at the back in the day, we had VHS playing on a big fat monitor screen and but there would be but they didn't do very much for us we would be my 10 by 10 foot booth and next to me is william morris who has god on the you know in his program program so so that they weren't that successful but we did that we made ourselves known and we joined the uh, arts presenters conferences where where we are the north carolina and south carolina arts presenters so we we did all the work that we knew to do <clears throat> and uh the reason that we were about the same successful with or without an agent is i don't think we had agents that really worked for us very hard mm -hmm. and when you presented this program to them did you mention that you were also kind of talking in between or did they not care about that that they just care oh it's this you know piano that's you know peaceful and that people are going to recognize all the songs they're going to be like their favorite songs from musicals or favorite pop songs was that the draw or did you also say like oh you know we also kind of have a a running shtick or whatever that goes along with it we absolutely talked about it. i i call them comedic monologues because i'm not telling jokes but i'm i worked at the um I lived in Los Angeles for 15 years and I worked at the comedy store. We mm. I don't know the comedy store, but uh, I was a pianist at the comedy store for six years. So I heard hundreds and hundreds of comics and I learned to write comedy. And it's, it's, it's really, it's comedic monologues. It's friendly. It's uh, family friendly. It's, uh, it's good natured, but it's, it'll, there'll be some guffaws and mostly more giggles, but it, 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 the reason I started doing that is that it invites people to be your friend. Like they're already your friend before you even touch the piano. Mm. Um, I had a comedian working with me in my show for a few years and, um, and he would come out and he, he was a Southern guy and he had a Southern accent and he'd come out and he'd say, so what are y'all guys here to see? And they said, Emil, Emil, what does he do? Plays the piano. Do you all know that when you bought the tickets? <laughs> <laughs> and so we get a start, you know, and then I would be the straight man and he'd, he'd I, I, I would, it was sort of self uh, discredit, not discrediting, you know what I mean? Self abnegating humor. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the, I'm the butt of the joke and he was the punchline and it was, it was good. But it, but it means it's a friendly atmosphere. I wanted my show to be not sit up straight and hold your, cross your fingers like this. You, I wanted it to be, we're all in my living room. These are potential friends and they came, they, they wanted to be good. They wouldn't have come here if they didn't think it was going to be a good show or they hoped it would be. So they're already on your side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I love that. I, I think that's going to be really helpful information for everybody that wants to get into this niche and, and 
performing arts centers are awesome. And I, and I never really thought about the fact that, yeah, they have to fill their season and they can't afford all the big names. Right. Cause I've noticed that too. Like there's this one that I like to go to in Maine when we visit Maine, you know, there's all these art, performing arts centers, like you don't know that they're even around, right. They're just like in backwoods Maine. And, you know, maybe they have a few people I've heard of, and then they have a whole list of people I've never heard of, but it's like, well, I'm only there for a week or two weeks, like I can only go see who's there when I'm there. And if I want to go there, I'm going to go. So yeah, they've got to, they've got to find artists for that. And I'm sure once you are at a performing arts center and you get a good review, is it much easier to get back there the next year? It much, much easier. Uh, some places I've been back eight times of like mm. every year for eight years. And, uh, and again, here's a, here's a kind of a good message for everybody. You can be, I have had a, non-stop very successful career without ever being famous and I, my message is you can be very very successful and never be famous and there's some people think particularly in their younger years as i did you're going to either you're going to get a record deal and be one of the big names that every uh, household name uh you're going to be the next in my case the next roger williams that's what i wanted to be uh somebody else wants to be the next liberace or somebody else wants to be the next andrea bocelli but you can have a wonderful, happy, exciting, successful life and never be famous. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, if it's okay with you, it's okay. It's I actually okay. think that's better, in my opinion. I don't actually want to be famous. <laughs> you know, it, there's a lot of hassle that goes along with that. Yeah. So you said that you are you are still making videos every week. Is that on a YouTube channel? Yes, I have a YouTube channel and, and um, uh, we make... Um, the, the video is uh, a series it's a mon montage we pick one one fine artist i mean by painters you know a watercolorist oil or whatever and just take that painters with his permission take that painter's work and make a montage of it according like the last one we did was um what the song what's new how's the world treating you and there are pictures of people meeting in a cafe and things like that whatever it goes up appropriate i did uh the song under the, under the Paris skies. And of course, there were all these cafe scenes of Paris and you, dozens of pictures. There are so many fine, fine artists out there. Mm. And so this was just, instead of just posting a, a, a static photo of my album cover with, you know, with, with me playing it with a, one of my tunes. And these are all the tunes I've already recorded in the past. What a great idea. I love that comparing it with with fine art. And is the goal of that like are you monetizing that YouTube channel or is the goal more to get people to go over to the streaming platforms? It's mostly to get them to the, go to the streaming platforms. The uh the YouTube channel is monetized but it it it's very I mean it's minuscule. Right. Yeah. It you really got to get a lot of views on YouTube to make good money there. Yeah. Um yeah. So being that you are older, have you beyond YouTube brace, embrace social media at all? Well, I, my daughter does my Facebook for me mm. and Instagram and Messenger. For, and she's, by the way, she's, she's uh, qualified to do that. She's a, she's an independent journalist and she does for her living. She does uh, as, a, as an independent, she does podcasts and things. She writes blogs for people. She has clients. Uh, that are com companies and they give her a subject that they need to write a blog about and she researches it and does blogs. So that's been her profession. Mm, that's nice. You have a lot of talented people in your circle already that have helped you, your daughter and your wife. I do. And I mean, those are essential, particularly what my wife does. Uh, in, in my book, I say there's a, the last chapter is called, you have to have a Judy. My wife's name is Judy. <laughs> you have to have one. It doesn't have to be your wife, it doesn't have to be, it could be somebody you hire, it has could be, it could be yourself, but you have to have someone. When you think about it, you've spent thousands of hours mastering your craft. How much time did you spend on mastering business? You know, for me, three hours, maybe. <laughs> so somebody who is good at that is, is you know, you think, and, and as you're, I was listening to one of your last guests, who's brilliant. Uh, she was talking about uh, Web3 and Meta Universe and NFTs and so forth. And there's so much that I don't know. And there's so much information on your show, for example, because I was looking at the, the titles of the different uh, podcasts that I, I feel like 
for anybody these days, there's tons more. We got we got all of our learning. My my wife got the book. Uh, I mean, back in 1988 or something, the book called the This Business of Music, which is a kind of a bible for that. And she read the book from cover to cover. But there were no, you know, we had no internet. And and I was recording on reel to reel, two inch reels. And my first uh, my first several albums were on cassette. It's, I know it's an ancient history. But it's gone so far so quickly, and it, and as you know, it's it's a it's a snowball effect. It gets faster. Quicker. It does. It does. But it's important that you guys you did embrace enough that you are paying the bills with your streaming. You didn't yeah. just like dig your heels in like some people want to do and be like, no, I'm only selling CDs and cassettes and, you know, <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm very glad that you did that. Um, I did want to ask, are you guys, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> are you guys selling sheet music of any kind with the arrangements that you're creating? Yes. And um, uh, a few, uh, we, when, when somebody asked for one, we, we have it done, but here's the, here's the thing. I'm not, I have, ref this is one where I have refused. I have refused to, to, I've had Sibelius for about 10, 12 years. I've had Finale before that. <clears throat> and I refuse to learn to do that. And all of my arrangements, in, entire catalog has never been written down. I, I, the way I make an arrangement is I play a tune over and over again with the tape running. And mm -hmm. then I listen back and I take the parts that I like and I write a few chicken scratch reminders and I learn my arrangements. So I've never written them down by hand. So if I have a, a service do it, yes, they can they can do a takedown. It's usually not, and it's it's accurate note wise, but it's not accurate fingering wise or mm -hmm. idiomatic things that you do. You know, when you I can't even explain it, but you use different fingering that's really important, or you maybe you divide the melody up between two thumbs or things like. Excuse me, and just as a since that we're talking to people who are musicians and making money, uh, because of mine are all cover tunes, I have about eight or eight or nine songs on uh, on a, a sheet music site. I get when if you buy a <laughs> if you buy a, one of my arrangements for five dollars, I get forty cents. Wow! So, so it's nothing. You know, it all goes to the publisher and the composer, which is understandable and, and fair. But it's, so it doesn't make sense for me to pay a whole lot of money, hundreds of dollars to get something transcribed by somebody who can do. Now, if I could do Sibelius myself, that would be good. Right, right. And I mean, you could potentially sell these on your own site. You know, you still have to pay the royalties and all that to the composers, but you could sell them for more. I mean, I'm just coming up with income ideas here. You could create, because I, I had someone on my show recently who does this kinds of thing and he sells it all through his own site and he's got funnels and things like that. Um, but you could create a video, because I believe my guest, Jason, he does this too, of showing them like, okay, yeah, you have the sheet music, but like, this is what I do to make it sound the way that I do. Here's how I finger it, blah, 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 that goes along with it. And then, you know, they pay more for that because they want to learn from him. And then, you know, they're paying a lot more than just for the sheet music. That's an, that is an excellent idea. And uh, early on we did, I didn't, I didn't do that, but I did a, a number, I think I have something like 21, uh, just videos of me playing certain tunes that people like. It wasn't, it wasn't explaining. It wasn't a teaching, it wasn't a teaching thing. It was just, you can see me playing the tune instead of just listening to it. But when we, and our first, the first time we made sheet music, we uh, we made hard copies and really nicely bound hard copies of the sheet music, and we sold some. But when we went to digital, uh, we sold a lot more digital. But on when we sold them hard copies, it would be ten dollars for a hard copy, and it has a beautiful cover, and it's you know, just a lovely thing, and and that was that was financially worthwhile. Uh, except as soon as people could buy them digitally, that's what they would do. Just like I do mostly by digital. Mm. Well, there's definitely still a market because uh, my guest two weeks ago, he uh, he did that and um, he's still doing that. He's selling books online, like physical music books and uh, thousands and thousands of them. So definitely right. check that out. Great. Does he do cover tunes or original? Uh, he does a lot of hymn arrangements. 
Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of them are probably public domain, but maybe some he has to pay royalties for. Some are his own compositions, but mostly he does a lot of him him arrangements and stuff. Um, so I'd love for you to tell people a little bit about your book as we're ending our interview here. Okay. Um, my book, it's called Play It Like You Mean It. And it's for for musicians, not just pianists, but musicians of, of, of any level where how come when this guy plays uh, the song as time goes by, you say, that's very nice. And this guy plays and you get, oh my gosh. I'm just really moved. And why does one artist move you and another artist doesn't? And that's, that is the thrust of the book. It's holistic, really. It's not how to play the piano. It's everything you need to know about playing the piano except how to play the piano. <laughs> we, we, we assume you can play to some degree. And I have some tips, uh, technically, just that I like to do. But that's that's almost incidental to the book. The book is how do you get from when you would say, yesterday we went to the beach and it was wonderful, or you could say, yesterday, oh my gosh, we were at the beach all day long and it thrilled us and, and the person is listening like this because well, I want to hear what happened next at the beach. And yes, the, going from just technical to the emotion infused. Yeah, and, and a lot of people, I, because, because of classical music, and my whole background was classical, and uh, absolutely, I knew lots of classical players who didn't move you but but my gosh you were impressed mm. Mm. well and then can they find your book on amazon yes and it's called play it like you mean it and i'll send you a, a, some links and things yes we'll definitely include those links in the show notes for this episode and then let people know how can they find you online if you just uh type in my name everything will come up i have a website and, and, and youtube channel and facebook and all, all the other things just by typing my name in perfect well they can learn to spell your name by looking at the title right. of this episode <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much emil this has been really great i love getting this perspective of somebody who's had such a long running career and seen all the different eras of the music industry right that's right <laughs> Thank you so much for, for lending all of your knowledge and experience. Thanks for having me as a guest. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.